My name is Harold Levy. I'm the executive director of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. Uh, welcome to Lansdowne, Virginia. And for those of you who don't know, you are in Virginia. This is not the District of Columbia. Um, but that is a good thing. So greetings. Welcome to the first ever meeting of principals of selected public high schools. Um, I am delighted that you're all here. There are over 100 schools represented in the room today. Uh, in the next two days, you're going to hear from a rather incredible group of people. Several of the nation's leading researchers on education of high-performing, low- and moderate-income students, from the leaders of the U.S. Department of Education about new initiatives, about legislative reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary School Act, also known as the No Child Left Behind Act, um, from the president and the executive director of the National Consortium of Secondary STEM Schools about how you can be heard on behalf of high-performing students in your city halls, your state capitals, and here in Washington. And from the leading education foundations about grants for which you can apply and about the largest scholarships available for your students. This will be intense, uh, I hope provocative, I hope educational. I know it'll be intellectually stretching. Um, and we have set the bar very high. And yes, there will be a test. <laughs> there will also be ample time for you to talk informally amongst yourselves, to learn from your peers, to share best practices, and I hope collaborate to plan and to commit to assisting one another going forward in a well-organized way. Um, but first, I have some acknowledgments, acknowledgments and some disclosures and some homework that I want to get out of the way. So um, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, first, uh, whenever I've gone to these meetings in the past, I've thought, okay, what are they selling? What's in it for me? Why are they doing this? Um, so I want all the disclosures out of the way. Why is the Jack Kent Cook Foundation doing this? What's in it for us? My goal here is twofold. One, the foundation is dedicated to providing the largest scholarships available to high-performing, low-income, and moderate-income kids. We give $40,000 a year last dollar scholarships to eighth graders, and then we open it up again in 12th grade. Over 97% of Cook Scholars keep their scholarship through graduate school. It's $40,000 a year. Do the math. We are the largest scholarship available. I urge you to take that home and think about which of your students should apply. Admissions committees know us. Even being designated a semi-finalist ought to be something that goes on their resume. It's important. Um, so. I want to make sure that you send me your best kids. Simple as that. That's my number one goal. Second goal. I also want to help you become spokespersons for gifted education, and particularly gifted education of low-income kids. I was one of them. The founder of the Jack Kent Cook Foundation was one of them. And many people in this room were one of them. We owe it to the others to help them, and that, too, is our motivation. So open hands, that's my reason for convening you. A, I want to find the best kids, and B, I want us collectively to begin to be heard for high-performing, low-income kids. I also want to acknowledge three people without whom this meeting would not have happened. Um, you'll be hearing more about them um, from them later, um, but I want to take the moment to recognize their really extraordinary work, support, and effort to get this day to happen. First, Crystal Bonds. Stand up, please. <laughs> Crystal is the principal of New York's High School of Math, Science, and Engineering, um, which is located on the campus of City College of New York. 
uh, she's also president of the Consortium of STEM Schools. Uh, by show of hands, how many people are members of the Consortium of STEM Schools? So we've got a fair number here. Thank you. Um, second, Todd Mann. Todd, stand up. He's the executive director of the Consortium and of Magnet Schools of America. Um, and he, too, has played a critical role in getting this done. Um, and third is Rebecca Cullen. Where is Rebecca? She's outside. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Rebecca is the head of the Young Scholars Program at the Jack Ken Cook Foundation. She and her team uh, have done the logistics for this event and have done an amazing job. So thank you. Really good. Um, and I also want to introduce uh, Barbara Schmertz. Barbara is the head of the College Scholars Program of the Jack Ken Cook Foundation. So if you have a child in your program and you think that they should apply for a Cook Scholarship, uh, talk with Rebecca or talk with Barbara. <laughs> Let's turn to that number behind me, um, in case you've been wondering. This conference has been 380 years in the making. On April 23, 1635, the Boston Latin School was founded as the nation's first public exam school. And this group of headmasters and principals and deans has never been called together before. We brought you here today to engage in a conversation about the students we care about, high achieving, low income, moderate income, this is the first ever meeting of principals of selected public high schools from across the country. And it is meaningful. You can see where we are all from. And I think the Californians decided not to um, deal with the weather. <laughs> we brought you here to have that conversation. And as you've seen, you represent 100 schools and foundations we will have other education leaders here, all of whom care about these students. It is potentially a very powerful group and a powerful organization could emerge. I want to start by making clear why it's important that you band together. The simple truth is that high-performing, low-income students are very fragile. While some of our students can perform at a very high level without much support, as you know, others are not so lucky. And as a political matter, if we simply advocate for gifted and talented programs, we are seen as elitist. The idea is those kids can get along on their own. Yet so many of our students come from low and moderate income backgrounds, and they cannot do it alone. We have a video that makes the point. Oops. Well, I was hoping we had a video that makes the point. We've given you packages that contain cutting edge research, that contains literature reviews, and how to cover, how to find these kids, how to educate them, at least what the best the researchers can tell us. It's obviously up to you to decide what really works. No researcher has your pragmatic experience. However, what's clear is that many of these children who start off as gifted don't stay there. The backsliding is particularly severe among the low-income kids, and that's where we have to act. A few years back, the foundation that I now head, well before I got there, funded some research that compared high- and low-income kids who scored in the top quartile on standard reading tests and math tests. The very smart, very poor kids lost out every time to the rich kids, every time. The chances of scoring well on a standardized test went down the longer they stayed in school. Their chances of graduating from college were not as great. And their chances of going to graduate school was almost 20% lower. The excellence gap does not stop there, however. When they do go to college, 
they're undermatched. They don't go to the most rigorous schools that they could. And a large number of the high performers don't even apply to college. If you take the kids who perform in the top 25% in the nation in the 10th grade reading test, and you identify the ones who are also low income, fully 22% did not apply to college. Did not apply to college. You know that the rep is, if you're poor and you're smart, you write your own ticket. That turns out not to be true, not close to true. And that's shocking. And it's unknown in the larger body public. It's our job to get the message out. The message for us, I think, is clear. Compared to rich kids in the top quartile, the poor kids lose out every time, at every level, in every way. I also want to say that coming together today could not be more timely. It's not just that we're 380 years in the making. There's something else going on. I think the public is beginning to turn our way and look at this issue. The January 24th issue of The Economist, for those of you who don't read it, I can pass it around. It says, the cover story on this says, America's new aristocracy, education, and the inheritance of privilege. The current issue of The Atlantic that came out this morning, I couldn't make this up, says, the rich get richer and more educated. Wealthy Americans have, been, um, have seen major growth when it comes to educational attainment, but the poorest Americans still struggle to graduate. In 2013, Americans in the highest income bracket were more than eight times more likely to have graduated from a bachelor's degree program than the kids at the bottom. It is stunning. And that's in the last two weeks. Two major news magazines had that as their cover story. The message is clear. Low-income children have greater difficulties at achieving their potential than rich kids, and high-performing low-income kids over time perform disturbingly more like low-income kids than they do like high performers. We have the power in this room to change that. And we do that by being heard in the places of power. I charge you that we have work to do, and the children who we represent need us. And we need to do this in a way that is both powerful and effective and coordinated. I have brought you together in the hopes that you will learn from one another, and you will find this, both the informal part and the formal part of these meetings, helpful. I would also hope that you give serious thought to coming together as a group and thinking through how, as a force, you can be heard in the halls of power. My pitch is very simple. The kids need your help. And the stats are devastating. We're calling this Closing the Excellence Gap, Advocating for High Achieving Low-Income Students. We only close it if everyone pitches in together. And that part is up to you, not a foundation or a former schools chancellor or a securities lawyer turned evangelist. So um, it's only appropriate to, uh, it's only appropriate to take that message, think through how we act and where we go from here. <laughs>